Good evening, everyone. How are you guys doing today? The Monday after Thanksgiving, also Cyber Monday, but I'm I'm not keeping track. So hopefully you guys are all doing well. Uh, I am looking for sound. I've had some audio configuration trouble over the last two days or so. So just let me know if sound is fine. I'm going to check the YouTube replay or playback. Sounds sounds pretty good on my end. So just to go ahead and let me know. And as you do that, or as I do that, or as you do that, I will go ahead and welcome the chat. So I am your host, Monday Night Muse, or Soundgiver, your Monday Night Muse. That's what I meant to say. And this will be a live impromptu. So any comments or input or remarks are certainly welcome. Uh, we're just going to talk you know, have a light discussion about overindulgence in art. And I've got a couple things, maybe two or three things to talk about as far as how to avoid overindulging in your art and, uh, you know, some of the telltale signs. And I'll probably use some music examples from my experience as a composer. And maybe you guys who are artists out there can use examples, uh, maybe what your tendencies are, uh, what you prefer, what you maybe put too much of in your art, even in your practice in the art, and uh, why that can be problematic. I hate that that's a problematic word. The word problematic is so problematic, but that, that's a good word, and I think I'm going to use it. So let's go ahead and welcome this, you know, welcome this very, already very long chat. So hello, and we're going to start with, oh, actually, let me check out sound first. Okay, audio is clear. Brian Gilmartin says, I read you loud and clear. And Schooner Tuna says, you are coming in good on my end. And Wolf 10 Media says, audio is clear. Thank you, guys. I do appreciate that. I am happy. So Professor Geek says, am I first? I am ready to learn. Well, you are always first in my heart, as we all know now. And I, of course, mention as much. And you call me your muse. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Big Al says, need to start a flirt jar for you two. A dollar for every sweet and cute little comment on chat. So who's who's getting paid? <laughs> who, who, who are, who's uh, getting the dollars? All need to figure out a billing system for you two. Schooner Tuna is I am here. And we've got Brian Gill Martin, of course, and Owen Lister. And we've got back to the drawing board. Hello, the chat. And yeah, I'm ready for your artists, uh, you know, you artists and your input on, you know, what I'm about to say. Definitely uh, welcoming uh, oh, uh, Melissa Harris, except not posting the comment. <laughs> but we did see that post by Casey Scott on the Facebook group page. And that looks a little interesting. That looks a little interesting. And someone, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Mike Stevens or someone on that thread said, you know, we're all talking about representation, but it's really, now that we see it, it's more of a representation of that individual artist. Like I'm the protagonist. So the pro protagonist has to look like me and talk like me and say everything I would say and think everything I would think and react to how I would react. No, that's that's not being a good writer. You write characters that are not you, but are that are compelling and that are believable. Oh yes, thank you, Wolf Ten. Fifth thumbs up. Oh hey there, Sound Graver. All right, and Melissa there. Good. Welcome, Melissa. And I think that's everyone. Oh, actually, we have Daniel Heron as well and all this stuff so i might just go on a just a, a light impromptu oh waylon and i, I want to say smithers but you know if you want to post in the in the comments you know what whether it's smithers or smithers just let me know Oops. and evie cool that i actually posted that by accident but there you go i thought i said i thought i had some one All right, so Owen Lister says, 
Sound engraver, today was one of those days I couldn't figure out what to draw. Give me a suggestion of what to draw. So is that like an exercise you do that you are needing a prompt uh, on what to draw? Uh, well, so you do characters, but you also do world building. I would, I would do something world building related today. Uh, maybe a weapon. Maybe, maybe, you know, write, write or draw something intuitively and see what kind of weapon you come up with. Like a javelin with a, a good design at the hilt. Or, or the, like a leather sheath of the sword or something like that. Well, no, you do science fiction, so, you know, but something high tech, you know, some, some sort of gear. Yeah, I agree, Brian. Yeah, it is. It is. Look at me. <laughs> All right. Okay. And it looks like Wolf 10 is giving you some ideas to own lister. So let's talk about overindulgence in art. And so you guys may be aware of why this is prompting uh, the topic for the stream tonight. As I had talked about overindulgence in art with the Star Wars character Ahsoka Tano. Now we don't have to talk about her if you don't want. Uh, I might use her as an example just in case you guys had questions on why I feel strongly about things, why I'm critiquing things the way I am, why I'm being objective and, and, and seriously objective. Um, well, I don't want to say seriously objective because it's already serious, but serious and objective why I'm, I'm saying all those things I'm saying on the Facebook group page, also on my Ahsoka commentary video. And if you guys haven't seen, um, I'm, I'm kind of happy, but, but the, the Ahsoka Tana video has become quite controversial. <laughs> um, I mean, at least by my standards. I, I, I have a, a like-dislike ratio I haven't seen before. So uh, I, I know I'm doing something that is, of course, ruffling up some feathers. But, you know, no matter what it is, no matter what art piece, no matter what art form, no matter what we are talking about in, in terms of art, what you will get from me out of my channel is always an objective critique or an objective applause or praise of something, like a um, me uh, commending an idea or a standard or an artist or, you know, endorsing something. I am an artist and I'm a professional and I will speak my mind and my thoughts, hopefully in a succinct way and in an eloquent way, but I will speak my mind on what I believe is objectively good. And I know a lot of people have a hard time with that. Uh, they're, they're having, I think as of late, especially as we're coming to the end of a very, very tough year for all of us, I think people are just feeling a little miffed at that, that idea. And I think people think that I'm negative. I'm actually not negative. Um, I, I very, very much enjoy art. I very much enjoy analyzing writing, reading on my own, writing on my own, composing music, listening to music. I mean, I'm, I'm all about this, you know, because art is my life. And so, uh, you know, I will be posting things later into this next year on, on some commentary that, you know, people might not prefer and that's okay. Uh, just tell me your opinions and I'm happy to have a discussion with you. But I've realized a couple things with my with my YouTube channel. If if I get traction like I have with the Ahsoka Tano video. Uh, the first thing is I probably won't do lengthy comment res responses. You know, even if your comments are lengthy and it's not bad, I, I read through them. But as far as, you know, pinpointing out certain things. It's just too cumbersome on text. Um, and I don't think it reaches um, uh, a wide enough audience there. I would rather just speak my thoughts and speak my mind because speaking is much faster than typing. And you can hear my voice. You can see my face. You, you can see I've got nothing up my sleeve, as I've said. So uh, last week, I think it was. Um, and, and so that's the first thing. So if you guys have any lengthy responses, whether you agree with me or disagree with me, I probably won't respond to every point. Most likely I won't. And the next thing is, um, I will say a few of the comments that I did get on my video. Uh, really, now some people just wanted to 
flat out disagree with me and just, you know, uh, you know, say I, I obviously don't understand anything, you know, it's those, those kind of comments. And I don't think any, uh, anyone in this community was, was that at all. I think it was, I think it was some people who were actively looking for something to be upset with. But uh, anyway, all that to say is if you write something about my video that tells me you didn't listen all the way, I may point that out, whether it's on stream or point that out in the comments, um, because it's not enough just to watch the video. It's not enough just to listen to the video. When I listen to a commentary video and I have a comment in mind to say and, and write down, I make sure I hear the person loud and clear what they're saying because I do not want to, you know, misinterpret them or um, say say something that, you know, let them know they said this when they didn't really say that. I didn't. I don't want to stretch the truth or or um, put words in their mouths. I, I don't think that's a careful or professional. And so if someone debates me on, on a, a comment stream and it is very clear that they haven't listened to all my points, I, I may point that out. That That's just, it, it's fair game. You know, it's on my channel and I'll be fair and I'll be kind, but please, when you comment, please, please comment in such a way where I can tell that you have listened to my video. I know that's a high standard, but I'm a music teacher. I talk to students all the time and I ask them questions in ways where their answers need to inform me that they've listened to me. Sorry, you might have to accept that I'm a little more professional on YouTube. Um, but anyway, all that to say, that was kind of a fun introduction. <laughs> um, I will talk about just a few things on how to avoid overindulgence in art. Now, when we talk about overindulgence, you know, one of the reasons why it, it prompted this, this stream, this idea, is because we're in the holidays. You know, we just finished Thanksgiving, where as wonderful as the holiday is, Thanksgiving also gets a pretty bad rap that, you know, we just kind of splurge. Uh, we we indulge ourselves in all this good food and all these, these good drinks and and we kind of experience as Americans this day of gluttony. In fact, I actually, I, I really commend people. I've heard people uh, tell me that they fast on Thanksgiving. And I think that's great because we already have, uh, it, it, in our culture, in our society, we have the ability to kill ourselves with food. Now, I know that sounds, sounds blunt, but if you've ever driven a long distance, like I'm talking about across many states. You'll notice when you're on the highway, let's say, let's say you've got a road trip, you know, crossing, um, you know, this, the, the Southeast. So in my case, I've, I've traveled from Dallas all the way to North Carolina, for instance, and beautiful, beautiful drives. I mean, I can't recommend road trips enough guys, if you haven't done road trips across the country, because, the United States has a dramatic landscape. It's awesome. But anyway, that's besides the point. When you're on the highway and, and you go on, you're on the road for several days, you see billboards of, of, you know, restaurants coming up and you see these giant glasses of Coke with ice and, and, and it's, you know, frothy at the top. You know, it looks so refreshing. You see these giant cheeseburgers and this big old giant pocket of fries. And you see that quite frequently on the road. And you see how, how every two miles or how every 10 miles is, is a stop at the gas station with all sorts of candy and junk food and all sorts of snacks and all sorts of delicious things uh, from, from special restaurants and stuff like that. Having gone on several road trips in, in my adult life, I, I really do understand that here in the United States, you have the opportunity to be your absolute healthiest or your absolute worst in terms of health or or i would just say your absolute best in general or your absolute worst worst we have everything available to us so i think celebrating thanksgiving with a lot of food i, I kind of think in a way it uh, it's rather pointless because we have all this to access all throughout the year so we tend to say, oh, it's, it's Thanksgiving. Let, let's, you know, stuff our faces. And, and we forget, well, we have the opportunity of stuffing our faces every day here in the, 
in, in America, even when things are tight, even when, you know, the economy is, you know, getting worse or whatever the case may be, um, we just have the ability to overindulge. And I think that being so evident in our culture can cause us to overindulge in our art. One thing about overindulgence is that it's, it's partaking of something that's most likely a good thing. In fact, I would say most of the time, maybe not all the time, but I would say most of the time you're indulging in something or you're overindulging. It's actually something of worth. It's something of value. It's something that is precious. You saw my delicious looking thumbnail, of course, you know, the, the fudge or the cake or the specialty cupcakes and, and all that. Now, I'm not a cupcake person myself. I'm not really a baked goods person, but if you take me to a specialty cupcake store, I will have a specialty cupcake because I like I like um, the culinary experience of a specialty cupcake versus a store-bought cupcake. Anyway, um, but the idea is it's you're usually partaking of something that is already good, but too much of a good thing can happen. You know, let, let's apply it to art, for instance. So I'll start with music. And guys, if you want to give me examples of your art or art in general, or maybe what you've seen in popular culture, just let me know. But let's talk about some examples in music as a music composer. Uh, let's say you have a liking as a composer to a parameter, a musical parameter. In this case, let's talk about high frequency. Maybe you have an affinity to toward uh, silvery kind of bell tones or something of a high frequency or maybe pure tones. Well, all that can sound great. And in fact, all that sounds rather pleasant depending on how things are mixed and, and put through the speakers and, and how um, tight you can get those sounds and how pure you can get those sounds. And, and high frequency bell tones are quite beautiful to listen to. But if you have that as a composer, if you have that going around speakers all across a room without a mid register, over time without a mid register or floor energy or low register like bass, even something that's beautiful and even something that's enjoyable to listen to can get tiring or vexing. It can, it can kind of vex you. There was one time where I was in, in a music lab with, with all, speakers all around me. And one of the student composers really loved bass. He loved the floor energy. And he wrote a piece with this kind of swelling energy coming from the subwoofer. Now, the effect itself is pretty cool. And it kind of, you know, it, it makes you alert. It makes you anticipate something. But I remember his piece, I don't, I, I don't think it was more than three minutes where it was just, just that. And I don't think there were, were any higher frequencies introduced. It was just floor energy. Now, while that can be effective at the start of a piece, at least in my case, I had a physiological reaction and my, my brain and my ears were hungering for something in the mid register or the higher register. Having that sense of balance with with that bandwidth where, where where you have you know things 30 hertz you know at, at, the, at the very bottom maybe 20 hertz at the very bottom and then something very very high like 10 kilohertz or something you, you need that balance you need that spread and so that's an example of overindulging when you when you have a preference to a very specific musical parameter in this case I was talking about frequency whether high or low but there's, there's not enough of something else. There's not enough of something else that uh, is different from that. There's, there's not enough contrast. There's not a, enough, um, uh, you know, dichotomy or, or juxtaposition. Um, you know, how, how can you compare this high frequency to something else? Uh, you know, how can, how, how can you compare this musical parameter you love so much? I don't have a reference to go on. Why should this musical parameter be so precious to me if I'm already getting tired of it. So that's that's the idea of overindulging in something you love. Overindulging in something that is um, accepted and beloved and, you know, universally beautiful. I think people all across the world have, in some form or another, they have an affinity to bell sounds because 
bell sounds mark something um, somber or joyous or religious or beautiful or pure, whatever the case may be in whatever country you are in, there's something beautiful about the bell sounds. You know, if you if you live in, in, in the United States, you know, especially kind of in the springtime and, and summertime, um, and especially if you live close by neighborhoods with verandas or porches, you'll hear a wind chime. And there's something beautiful and remote about a wind chime. But there might be something more you need, or maybe a wind chime going on forever is just too long before you want to hear something else. So that's an example with music. And let's go ahead and <laughs> take a look at that chat. I just see Big Al's uh, thumbnail. That thumbnail looks delish. It did look good. And I had a piece of pecan pie when I was putting up that thumbnail. So I, I, was, I was indulging in some leftover pie. I'm finished with the pie now. Thank you, Melissa. Congrats to the professor and sound engraver. Oh, hello, Jedi Master Cetopia. How are you? So, Brian says, my Thanksgiving dinner was just turkey, mashed potatoes, and some biscuits, no more. Yeah, it, it doesn't need to be over the top. So before I get into more chat, how, how can you overindulge or really how can you avoid overindulgence? You know, what, what are some things you can take with this? Well, I have a few things, two, two to three things, I would say. Uh, the first is you have to know your limitations. For pretty much every parameter or aspect in your art. So for me, I, I need to know my limitation when it comes to time in, in a piece of music. Does this piece of music need eight minutes? Or maybe it's fine as three minutes, you know? So in, in terms of time, I need a limit. In terms of instrumentation, how many instruments should I use? What should I use? Should I use two bass instruments? Should I use two to three cents? Should I use two drum kits? I actually have one of my tracks and it's like three minutes. It's, it's a three minute piece, but this track has two drum kits because it there, there are two sounds going along with each other. They're, they're complementing one another, but not every time. In fact, you know, a couple tracks I've had I've, that I've released, the drum kit is just maybe one bass instrument and a couple higher instruments. It, it doesn't need to be a lot. It just depends on the piece and uh, the, the narrative going along with, with that piece. So instrumentation, timing, um, the bandwidth, as I had mentioned, is this too much bass? Is it an, is it not enough bass? Am I using the same chord progression for too long or for too much? Whether that's one track or whether that's several tracks. You know, I, I sometimes think about music while I'm driving or walking or doing the dishes and, and I'll replay a harmony that I really like. But if even if, if that harmony is so attractive, over time, it can get old over a number of pieces, even if it's the same harmony with a completely different instrumentation every time people could think, okay, well, she does, she uses that harmony and I like that harmony, but it's too much. I want her to try something else in another track of her album. So with me, it could be a matter of harmony. It could be a baseline. You know, I could, I could use the same baseline too much. Now I, I have the, the advantage of being an experimental, uh, you know, sound experimentalist and, and being experimental in my music. So um, I have been uh, happy to, to have my albums have very unique, very distinct tracks every time. Now, I only have two albums out there. The third one's coming eventually. Um, so we'll see see where, where that goes. But, but my next few albums, every track is different. Every track has a different harmony, a structure, different baseline, different instrumentation. I, I've been very intentional about keeping every track distinct. And I have, I have 
many artists that I that I love and I love their instruments and I love their compositions, but they'll they'll use the same instrument throughout every track. And it's it could be a beautiful instrument. It could be a wonderfully unique instrument, you know, unique to that artist. But if they play that instrument every track, as good as that piece of music is, it's too much. It's like, you know, I, I know this is your instrument. Let's 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 hear something else. You know, we want we want that variety. You know, we want we want variety in a chocolate shop or a chocolate section of a of a shop or understand there's variety with the chocolate section. But we have a whole variety of candy in the candy shop to choose from as well. So know your limits. Guys, tell me tell me where you uh, fall short or what you think uh, need. Um, what, what do you think needs limitations uh, in your art? Um as, as illustrators, as colorists, as writers, what what do you have in your art um, where you, you know, where you set those limits? That would be good to know. So that's the first thing is how to avoid overindulgence is understand that things have limitations and pretty much everything in your art at, in some way or another has a limit. Nothing is really indefinite, you know, unless you're Unless you're working in super collider and you and you run a synth and then you go away and, and you drive across the state or across the country and come back and super collider's still running. Yeah. Super collider, a computer can run things indefinitely, but we as human being beings, we need we need a break. We need um, you know, a bit of a pause. We need closure. And that actually gets to my second tip or idea on how to avoid overindulgence. That is closure. We need closure. We need proper closure to things. Things that are, are ready for closure. Music again, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to close a piece of music after five minutes or eight minutes. Or, you know, you could do a single track that's 58 minutes long. Like I actually, I think I'm gonna buy this album. It's actually really cheap. What is his name? I think his artist name is Iguana. It's kind of like a new age ambient artist. Um, I mean, not not actually new age is probably not the best genre term, um, but it is, it, it's got 58 minutes of just this beautiful ambience that can just kind of transport you as you're writing or doing email or something like that, or doing menial tasks. So 58 minutes might sound like a lot, but he's very good with his sounds. He's very good with, with his ambient tone where I could just be lost for 58 minutes, just, you know, being focused in the zone, whether it's writing or filling out an invoice or whatever the case may be. So it, it can have its function. 58 minutes was the limit for, for that album. And I think that was fine. In fact, I don't think it's an album. I think it's a single track that's 58 minutes, uh, but that's fine. It, it's beautiful music, especially through these studio headphones. Um, but, you know, going back to closure, it's pretty easy to close up, you know, wrap up a piece of music when you're when you're finished. You know, wrapping up a, a performance, for instance. You know, you 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 can, the body can go only so far. Yeah, as 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 a musician, you know, keeping keeping your shoulders up and and your arm up and all of that. So, uh, it's easy for music. I think with writing, it's hard. Writing is hard. Um, so, for instance, I think. One thing I'm seeing in in writing today, whether it's in film or what have you, is people have a hard time saying goodbye to characters. You know, whether that's a writer having a hard time saying goodbye to characters, but it's like, you know, the the, the character has served their role, they've served their purpose, and and it's okay to move on. It's okay to move on, or have the character do something else. Yeah, I'm thinking about Ahsoka, sorry. <laughs> but in any case, you know, it's not just, it's not just Star Wars I'm thinking of. Um, things things have closure. There There is death in stories. There is um, departure. There's people moving away, maybe transferred, you know, got a position and transferred out of the state. You know, they, they had they, they had those kind of conclusions with, uh, well, one of the sitcoms I'm thinking of is Growing Pains, where 
Maggie, who is a respected local journalist, uh, she got a prominent position in Washington, D.C. And so that was the that was the closing of that whole family show, Growing Pains, where they, they move out of the house. And, and it was the closing of the season. They didn't they didn't continue the season with those actors. That that was the ending of the show uh, upon moving out of that house. And that was perfect. They didn't need to keep going. I think didn't I think Fresh Prince of Bel Air do that too, where the family moves out. I can't remember. I don't think I saw the last season of that. But yeah, there's there's closure when it comes to sitcoms and television shows. I can't stand it when shows extend much further down in in, in terms of length. Uh, th than necessary. You know, if, if a show has a beautiful ending or kind of a beautiful closing or wrapping up at the end of season five or at the end of season four, then 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 leave it. You know, don't don't drag these characters through another three or four seasons if it's going to, you know, sully the writing, sully the the character growth or, or development, you know, just have closure. So that's the that's the other thing to think about when you're working on your art and it, you know, coming across overindulgence is, does this thing have an end? Should it have an end soon? Or or will the end be fitting later down the road? But the ending has to be there. You have to keep the ending in mind. And I would say the third tip or idea would be to be experimental. Now, again, I, I'm an experimental artist, you know, sound experimentalist. I like to work with all kinds of sound textures and soundscapes and all that. So I have the advantage of already knowing how to do this and, and making different things sound unique and distinct as much as possible, still still sounding like me, you know, still sounding like something Sound Engraver would produce or compose, but still each having their own uh, unique uniqueness, you know, each piece of music, each instrument having their own uniqueness. I would say with drawing or writing, that can be hard. Uh, let's say with writing, for instance, you have a team of people. And it could be, let's say it's a team of teenagers or getting into the young adults, and there are about eight of them, and you've got three guys and five girls. Well, five girls can't all sound the same. You know, every one of those girls have to sound unique. Every one of those girls, if, if, if it's including illustration, should have a unique look to their face and expression. And I can't remember, I feel like it's one of you guys who did a, who did a review on a, a recent comic or campaign. I think it's an independent campaign where there was one minor detail is it you, Brian? I can't remember. Um, but there was one minor detail that you you kind of overlooked, but you still picked up and you wish it weren't so. And that was uh, the face of the main female protagonist looks, because she has the same hair color, looks, if you're not careful to see, looks like the villain of, of that of that story. So you you certainly can't have readers confused. You know, if they see a female protagonist and there's a female villain, well, don't do not do it in any way where you're confusing the readers. It's like, wait, oh, no, that's the villain. Like, you turn the page, like, no, that's the villain. You, you can't, readers can't waste time without, like, two seconds looking at the, at the woman and say, no, she's not the good guy. She's the bad guy. Um, so that, that's an example of um, practicing experimentation where how would you make a team of teenagers look different? and sound different and have different facial expressions, a different mannerisms, different ways they talk. You know, an idea of overindulgence is maybe all the characters look and sound the same, have the same mannerisms, talk the same. Sure, you could say, well, they're, they're best friends and they're hanging out every day all the time and they're teenagers, you know, same age demographic, but no, Every, everyone is still unique, even inside that age demographic. So, you know, work with experimentation. You know, try to stretch yourself. Don't even, um, you know, don't get stuck after. You could, you could find if, you, if you've done enough projects, you could, you could find yourself being stuck in a kind of mindset 
maybe it's a kind of world building, maybe it's a kind of character, maybe it's a kind of archetype that you just, you haven't really budged from. Uh, with my case in music, it could be, I think, I think what I struggle most is having kind of a formulaic structure with all my pieces. It could be a different length. One could be three minutes, one could be eight minutes. Uh, one could have a completely different set of instruments from the other, but the, the structure has been more, lo uh, more or less the same where, um, you just to give you an idea, I'll have, uh, I'll have maybe, let's say it's a five minute piece or six minute piece and probably around two minutes and 30 seconds and three minutes, the bass will pull out and then I'll just have some percussion or the percussion will pull out and I'll just be the synth or everything will pull out except the bass. The idea of pulling out at, at a certain ratio. So like if it's a five minute piece, that usually happens around, I'd say two minutes, four or five seconds to three minutes approximately. Or if it's an eight minute piece, maybe, uh, maybe two times, um, but toward the six minute mark, uh, at the end. So I have to really work with having a, a little bit of change and variance in the form. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for that, that impromptu. I, I didn't have any notes. I was, I'm just kind of rolling with it tonight, but uh, let's see what you guys have to say in the chat. <laughs> I like a, uh, like Evie saying, as a sound engraver, you've learned to listen well. Yes. All right. So, um, oh, these are good. I, I'm seeing some really good examples. Let's see. I'm, I'm trying to find the where I last left off. <laughs> Wolf 10 says, I just finished another one of my characters and we'll be working on some more stuff. Good, G glad to see you're, you're getting the practice in. Summer vacation is over. Uh, oh, when Lister says a weapon, I can do that. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to think of something that's not a character or a place. So, some sort of item. Evie says that video has got a, quite a bit of views. Uh, for me, you know, I don't get a lot of views. I, I average about I mean, over time, let's say, let's say it's two months in after the video is published, I average about 200, 300 views. Hopefully as the subscriber count increases, then there'll be more. And actually people, the, the, the videos that get the most views over time is my super collider videos. Uh, my artistic commentary videos, you know, it, it, I think I'll have a wider audience as my channel keeps publishing more videos uh, going between super collider and original music and performance videos and commentary videos. But Everything I do is, I, I try to, you know, uh, do it with as, as good a standard of excellence as possible. Schooner Tuna says, all right, I will start us off. My biggest problem is I underestimate the intelligence of my readers. I am not proud of it. Well, um, that's, that's actually a good, good, good idea to roll with. Um, Okay, so we're talking about writing in this case. Here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. On the one hand, you do not want to spoon feed your readers because, right, they have intelligence, they have an imagination. On the other hand, you better properly convey exactly what you want the readers to know or what you want the viewers to know if you're a filmmaker. I will do a commentary video on the poor, poor writing of Siege of Mandalore. I wonder actually, can I share my screen? Um, my entire screen, my Brave tab application window. I don't know. 
I've got notes on the Siege of Mandalore. The writing is pretty poor. It's pretty terrible. And, and one of the problems, it's actually not one of the biggest problems either. One of the problems is it doesn't convey exactly what needs to be conveyed in that scene to make me understand if, if that's what the character intended or not. You don't want the readers guessing. Now, if you write something and the reader totally misses it, then that's one thing. But if you write something in a way or show something on film in a way that confuses the reader, that confuses the viewer, like, okay, wait, what's, what's the character's motive here? Why did they say it in this way? Why is she crying this way? Is she, is she crying because she's devastated at her mistake or is she crying because they all died? <laughs> Siege of Mandalore. Um, yeah, so yes, the readers do have intelligence. They have imagination. They have an imagination and you want to respect that and honor that. But uh, I, I run into this problem as a writer too, where I'll go back a few chapters to edit and then I'm thinking, wait, what did I mean by that? I'm like, oh, I meant that, but that's not clear. That's not going to be clear to the reader if it wasn't even clear to me, you know, having written the chapter. So, yeah, you have to be very clear. You don't want to spoon feed the reader. You do want to, you know, ignite the reader's imagination. But at the same time, you got to convey things clearly. You got to convey a sequence of events clearly. And you certainly have to convey the, uh, the character's motives and emotions and reactions very clearly. And by the way, that schooner tuna, that, that kind of thing takes time. <laughs> Wolf 10 actually is kind of saying what I'm saying. You know, I expect my readers to be intelligent and if they don't meet that, I pity a fool. Um, and I, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so here's, a, here's an example. So let's say you write science fiction or fantasy. Let's say you write something that involves world building and it, it involves the spelling of a name. Let's say it's a name of a, a desert, for instance. And, and the name, in, unless the author mentions it on a YouTube channel or puts it as an insert in, in maybe a back flap of names and geography, you know, unless that's there, you know, the, the, the reader can hear the name however they want in their head, you know, unless unless they have a direct reference, a direct reference um, to to that name. Now, Tolkien, with some of his books, I think the Tolkien estate and that the publishing house involved, they were they, they actually did a glossary of how things were pronounced and how things were said. Uh, for instance, I believe Galadriel's husband is Celeborn, Ke Celeborn, with the hard C. It's not Celeborn, with the soft C. And it's, it's. I remember it being, oh, I think, I think it was like a, in a glossary behind the Cimmerillion. So, you know, of course, you know, you, you got to give that. I feel like that, that wasn't a good example of what, what Wolf 10 said. Um, okay, I have a better example. Okay. Real life surnames, okay? So if you have an American reader read a character with a Japanese surname or a Korean surname and they don't know how to pronounce it in their head, that's fine. What the writer should absolutely not do is inside the book, inside the story, put parentheses and say, this is how you pronounce this name. This, with this nuance or with, with this enunciation, I have seen that in books. I have seen the, the last name Lee, for instance, L-I. And I, I've seen it put in pronounced L-E-E. -E. So what if I pronounced lie? What if I pronounce that name in my head as lie instead of Lee? So what? You know, if, if the reader misses it, then, then that's fine. But, and I'm, I'm kind of using trivial examples, but th the point is readers might miss something and, and come back to it or, or don't. You know, that, that, that's, that's going to be the case, too. But, but if 
your reader is intelligent, if your readers are intelligent, which I believe every reader is intelligent, you, you, you have to properly convey what the motive of a character is or what the scene is. Because if, if, or if an intelligent reader is confused, they're gonna piece all these in, you know, uh, th this, this logic, this conditional logic, like, oh, wait a second, if this is this, well, will this be this? And if it's not, why didn't you say so? You know, people, at least I do, I, I piece that together when I watch a show or when I, um, when I read a book, it's like, wait, that, that wouldn't happen, you know? So anyway, kind of going on a rant. Evie says, people are very tired of people being outraged about art. You seem too chill to fit into that cat category though, Essie. Well, um, I'm very objective about art, but objective does not need to be me being, you know, it doesn't need uh, to be angry. You know, that, that, that doesn't mean, uh, I'm not saying my sentence very clearly. Just because I'm objective about art or I have a critique on a certain thing doesn't mean I'm angry or outraged, but it can mean that I'm serious. Um, I, whether I talk about it on stream or on a commentary video, I think there are very serious things, very, very serious ramifications about Ahsoka Tano's treatment and the writer's treatment of Ahsoka Tano. And if you guys are curious, I'll, I'm, I'm happy to uh, indulge <laughs> uh, you with, with that too. But I, I do think there are some pretty bad telltale signs of what Ahsoka Tano will ultimately do to Star Wars. And I'm not against Ahsoka Tano. Um, I think people are kind of teasing, like I'm, I'm kind of hearing people on chat or uh, people on stream, other, other streams like, oh, you know, you know, Sound Engraver hates Ahsoka Tano. I'm like, I don't hate Ahsoka Tano. I actually really like her and I'm very sad. She's being reduced to a terrible, um, a, a terrible character. I, I know that sounds harsh, but the way they wrote her in the Siege of Mandalore is a slap on that face, a slap on her face. And I'll be objective and I, we could talk about it. But um, I, I think I'm, I'm seeing some grave things with how they're ushering her into everything including her involvement with Luke Skywalker. And so I'm not outraged, but I am serious. And I will, I will say, say as much and, and, and talk about the, the weighty things that could happen with her treatment. But that's only if you guys want to hear it. <laughs> Schooner Tuna says, what I mean is I get way too wordy in my stories and explaining things with way too much detail. For example, two paragraphs could be condensed in into three sentences. Oh yeah, but that 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 just takes practice. That takes practice. Uh, I, I suffer with that too. I have a you know I've been telling you guys I'm I'm pretty much on the last leg of my first installment of the space opera, and. It's 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 coming on three. Oh, it's actually over three years, a little over three years since I've started. But I've been obsessed with the story for years, probably a number of years now. And I, I have no doubt that my that 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 the ending or the last half of the book is much more concise and much better written than the first half. I wonder what that first half looks like right now. Um that that takes practice, but good good on you to to understand that and and know where the limits are. Some sometimes you can go on go along with prose. Um, I have my speculative novel that I sometimes it'd be just a page of prose, but it was a it was very active, it, and it was also very very intense. It was a very ten, intense um, moment, but I remember going on a whole page of prose. Yeah, I'll get on that. Right now I'm gonna work on the javelin. 
that uh, Sound Engraver gave, the suggestion that she gave. Yes, good. Actually, well, Tim, what was the context? Would you count me as professional at times? Um, I, I uh, as far as streaming or chatting or um, social media, I can't remember what I was talking about with with uh, oh, being professional with my, with the comments. Oh yeah. Um, well, actually, I I mean, I don't know because as far as um, you know, videos. Oh, well, you are on Facebook, on the Facebook group, and and I and I see that you you are very, um, very much the same uh, with with the chat, and I, I've heard you too. I've heard you speak, and you know sometimes you can geek out. I geek out too, you know, and all that. And and I'm not saying being professional means you can't have fun, but the thing is, I and maybe it's just because I've I've been a student and I'm a teacher now and stuff like that. But but when I when I see a comment that's disagreeing with me. I'm not against anyone disagreeing with me, but by any stretch of the imagination. Now, if the person's disrespectful, then I just remove their comment. If, 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 if they say my opinion is stupid, why would I leave that up? Uh, that's, that's, I don't, it, it's like if I let a student say another student was stupid or played terribly, what do you do? You reprimand that student. So I reprimand by removing those comments. Um, but if, if, if people disagree with me with, with, with arguments to be made, sure. I let, I, I let those comments stay up and I've let some comments where, where they are kind of disrespectful at the end, but then I, then I respond to them and I, and I thank them for their input because they did put the input there and that that's all. But so I would say being professional, I do, if, if there is a point of contention or disagreement where they have missed my point and I, I didn't really see it this time around but I, I could imagine it could it could get worse over time if, if it's obvious they haven't heard it all the way or listened all the way I, I will bring that up because I, I, I don't want to be misconstrued that's that's the one thing I, I have to you know th there's cause to protect your rep um, uh, reputation Brian Gilmartin says, I think your video was controversial because people have an emotional attachment to Ahsoka, which can cause people to react poorly to any criticism of her, even a well argued, well argued one. Well, I think that I think that's it. Um, excuse me. I just had a big dinner. <laughs> it it's something that our culture has taught us. I, I was talking about it with Professor Geek last night. It's, a, it's something that our culture really has taught us over these last several years, especially the last couple of decades with internet and social media and all of that. And that is when you like something, when you like a piece of art and then there's objective criticism against that piece of art, you feel defensive. Now, I think it's because people have not been taught this. And I think this is important. People need to understand that you can like something and you can enjoy something and you can be entertained by something and still understand or know, or maybe not even know that it's bad. It's bad. It's bad piece of art or it's bad writing or it's a bad movie or something like that. You can enjoy something and love something and it can be poorly done. It can be poorly made. I've said on my stream before, sometimes I'm going to listen to some retro music that is poorly produced. I can't listen to something poorly produced for too long, but sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll have a little tick and, and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, I like this, you know, and, and this is kind of zany. This is kind of cheesy and this isn't really that well produced, but I still like it. <clears throat> and if people came to me saying, I don't know what you're listening to, Michelle, but it's really not good quality. <clears throat> I say that I agree. It's not good quality and I still like it. Now, if people say I'm dumb for liking something that's poor quality, then that's another thing. That, that, that's, that, they, they are out of their place to say that. They are out of line to say that. Now, my critique on Ahsoka Tano, for people, especially with the sensationalism that has um, come with The Mandalorian in this recent episode, which I will, I, I will give full disclosure, I, 
I've never seen the Mandalorian, so so I don't know. It could be objectively uh, an objective piece of art, but there there's something bigger going on that uh, I might talk about on a on a later video. Unless uh, Professor Geek prompts me with some of his comments. <laughs> well, what was I saying? Um, my critique on Ahsoka Tano in Star Wars does not mean I think less of that person's intelligence who, for whoever loves that character. I love that character, but I don't demean or disparage against that person's intelligence. If that person, if people love the Siege of Mandalore, they love it. If they're entertained by the Siege of Mandalore, they're entertained by it. It's very attractive to behold. The music is awesome. I love the music. Uh, I remember the professor, and, and I can see why he did, but he, he he was complaining about kind of a very slow-paced part where, you know, Maul is imprisoned. He's kind of encased in this thing, and he's kind of Ahsoka Tano's trophy. Now, to him, that was a long scene, but to me, that was a perfectly timed scene because the music, I was I was too distracted by the music at that time when I first saw it. Now now I can see when I wasn't thinking about the music, I'm like, yeah, that is kind of a long drawn out scene where, there, where there's nothing happening. Um, but just because I'm critiquing the, the writing of the episode, sorry, I have this like hair that is not coming off, sorry. Um, just because I'm critiquing the writing of the Siege of Mandalore does not mean I think less of you for liking it or for being entertained by it. I'm not going to call you um, a simpleton. I'm not going to say you're, you have no intelligence or you have no know-how or anything like that. If you like it, you like it. But I will call out what is wrong with it because I, I just do that with art in general. I just have to. I'm an artist. I'm, I'm also a bit of an academic when it comes to those things. Why? Because I love excellent art. And that's not to say you can't have cheap entertainment out there. There's a place for cheap entertainment too. I'm, and I'm not saying Clone Wars Season 7 is cheap entertainment. I'm just, I'm just saying there's, there's a huge gamut of, of things. There's a huge gamut of levels of entertainment. And my concern overall is that the standards of excellence is being reduced more and more as time goes on in terms of writing, pacing, even music, if it comes to that, if, if, if I pick up some things. Now, what do I mean when I say this is I don't mind that there's cheap entertainment out there. And I don't mind that there's bad art out there to be liked and to be enjoyed. But what I do mind, what I do have concern with is we're not preserving the high art. We're not preserving what's good quality art, what's, what's objectively excellent. That's what I, I fight to preserve. That's why I will be critical because I want people to understand if, if they, if they're inclined, if, if they're, if they're not inclined to listen to me, that's, that's, that's another thing. But I, I do want people to understand where I'm coming from with this channel that I, I think we ought to preserve what is good, what is true, what is beautiful. And Star Wars has, so far had a very good record of being good art. But now in recent years, we're seeing a reduction of that quality, a, a terribly dramatic reduction of that quality. And the Siege of Mandalore in the Clone Wars season seven is no exception. That's what I say. And just kind of to re recap, uh, you know, people, are, are mad at me for saying that Ahsoka's um, role has been uh, very much overly saturated. Uh, and I think people are upset that I'm upset by that because I should accept Ahsoka Tana point blank. Well, no, I actually accept her for being so much better than she's been handled. She, needs, she, she had to have been handled much better than she is being handled now. Um, and that's my rant. Let's see. That's right, Evie. Like the bell from the magician's nephew. Thanks for that, that callback or comeback. Callback, callback. 
There's nothing wrong with that. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Man, way to bring it back, Evie. Okay, so that, that's a very good point. The bell starts sweetly. It starts golden. It starts beautifully, but then it becomes destructive. See, that's the thing is you can use too much of a good thing. You can, you can actually have a good thing, an objectively good thing that is beloved and have it ultimately destroy. Now, it might be years in the making, but the reason why the professor and I are so strong in our stance regarding Ahsoka Tano's treatment, and if you, if you guys are tired of listening to it, that's fine. I'll, I'll just keep saying it on my channel, is because we are... I, um, of course, I can't, I can't speak for the professor, but we've we've had long conversations about this. We are convinced, well, at least I am convinced or almost convinced that Ahsoka and her involvement with Luke Skywalker will ultimately replace Luke Skywalker. And if that happens, a dangerous precedent has been set. And that is you can erase characters and you can erase their stories and you can erase their legacies. Now, what does that mean in popular culture? I'm going to go on a little rant for now and we could talk about it later or we could talk about it. Maybe, you know, the professor and I can talk about it on, on another separate stream. But what would that ultimately mean if Ahsoka actually replaced Luke Skywalker? And I'm not talking about in prominence. I'm talking about replacing him in his own story. By her being the active role in Anakin's redemption, she has no place in that. Luke Skywalker, only Luke Skywalker, not even Leia had any place in Anakin Skywalker's redemption. It was his son, Luke Skywalker, only. And if that is supplanted, if he, if if Ahsoka is the the if it's her mission to persuade Luke Skywalker to turn Anakin back to the light side, if if they do that. They have effectively reversed and replaced Luke's entire story. What does that mean for popular culture? Well, two things. It means if that can be done, if a character replaces another character, a character that was already universally beloved and accepted, just like she is, just like she is. If she effectively replaces Luke Skywalker and replaces the aspirational hero of the Star Wars saga, well, what does that mean? Two things. The first is she will ultimately be replaced with another character. And that's bad. That that's so dangerous. Why 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 would we accept this constant reversal, this constant upheaval, this constant replacement if this happens? If this happens, this will be a pattern. This won't stop with Ahsoka Tano. This will start with every character. And and this is the danger. And this is why I'm so objective about art, because I I, I I focus on the the actual piece, the you know in this case Siege of Mandalore, as I've been talking about. But then I look at the bigger picture. If Ahsoka, if Ahsoka Tano replaces Luke Skywalker in his story, twenty years down the road, forty years down the road, she's going to be replaced. Now, even bigger than that, and you guys can call me far fetched. And you know what the thing is, I don't think we'll be around. I I don't think any of us here who are who's over thirty or forty will be around long enough to see it happen if it happens. But if Ahsoka Tano, Dave Filoni's baby, his character, if she replaces Luke Skywalker, George Lucas's character, what's gonna ultimately happen is that Dave Filoni is going to be remembered for Star Wars, not George Lucas. I don't think a thing like this would happen until 60 or 80 years from now, if Star Wars is still prevalent. If Star Wars is still alive and ticking, and I hope, I hope Star Wars has a very long history. I want longevity for something like Star Wars. I think it's very important. But notice we've been talking about, I mean, all across the internet, I've been hearing this word floating around, and I do not like it. And that is the Filoni-verse. The Filoni-verse. I'm not against him himself. I'm, I'm not against Dave Filoni. He's, he's a creative. He's an artist, just like George Lucas is an artist. And I am certainly not in a camp. I was, I was, I was accused of being a Luke Skywalker fangirl who couldn't take Ahsoka Tano getting so much attention. That's not true at all. I'm, I'm, I'm scared for a character like Ahsoka Tano and, and getting this mistreatment. 
like she's kind of being shoehorned in all these things to to make everything orbit around her that's not how you treat a character she she deserves better than that just like ray palpatine deserved better than that i feel bad for ray you know i feel bad for what they did to her who come on in the chat are, you guys are with me who feels bad for finn i feel terrible for finn he wasn't treated right either he was treated terribly he was he was a terrible character terribly written who had such great potential at the start of force awakens ray the first 18 minutes of that film massive amount of potential for that character and what do they do they cheapen her they cheapen finn they produce finn ahsoka tano is going to be the same it's going to be harder to detect because we've had a history with ahsoka, ahsoka tano but they won't be able to help themselves. If the writing of the Mandalorian has the same patterns as Siege of Mandalore, mark my words, it might not happen in the events of Mandalorian, but it will happen in the Star Wars universe where something good is being replaced. It first will be Luke Skywalker and we've seen his treatment with The Last Jedi, so it's already been done, the damage has been done. To, to further things along, he will be replaced by Ahsoka Tano. And then further down the road, 20 years from now, 40 years from now, Ahsoka Tano will be replaced with someone else. The replacing, the removal of characters, the removal of beloved characters. That's the sad thing. And then ultimately, if everything orbits around the Clone Wars and if everything orbits around Ahsoka Tano from here on, George Lucas's memory will be erased over time. Maybe not until three or four or five generations from now, but the memory of an artist, the artist who started it all. I don't agree with everything he has done. And if he wrote Ahsoka like Dave Filoni's written her, I wouldn't have agreed with it either because I'm, I'm objective guys. It doesn't matter who it is. You know, people think you're the George Lucas kid. I'm like, no, I'm not. But what I fear, what I'm concerned with is People will put around so much hype around this Filoni verse that in 40 to 50 years from now, George Lucas will not be remembered. I know that sounds extreme, but with how characters are being treated and how this hype about this is the way, Filoni is our man. I'm not against Filoni himself. But it's not expanding. It, notice it's not expanding from George Lucas anymore. It's, it's expanding from the Clone Wars. The Clone Wars were necessary. I love that animated show. I love it to bits. For all its writing flaws, I really do love that show and I appreciate that show. But notice how everything is connecting to the Clone Wars. We had it with Rebels and that's fine. That, that makes sense chron chronologically. Something like Rebels should have happened after Clone Wars. But now with the Mandalorian, what was the original, what was the original appeal of the Mandalorian? From from Thor Skywalker's videos, I I thought the appeal was, oh, this is kind of like a Western, away from the Jedi, away from force users, right? Away from the force. This is just kind of like a at least that's what I heard from videos like Thor, Thor Skywalker when, when the Mandalorian first came out. It was like this own thing. It was separate from all of the Jedi, separate from all of the Force. What do we see? We see the Dark Saber. We now see Ahsoka Tano. I guess there's rumors that Luke Skywalker's coming. Well, that didn't take long, did it? They had to make the Mandalorian beloved and they have to attach it to something like Luke Skywalker. If the writing was not as it was with the with season seven, I probably wouldn't be so concerned. But I will do a video. And I'll do a live stream actually on the writing of the Siege of Mandalore. Because that project, season seven of Clone Wars, is not that old. We're we're talking about two or three years difference between Clone Wars season seven and Mandalorian. Yeah, actually, well, they were they were kind of produced. I don't know the the production schedules and all that, but 
these these projects are very close. They're relatively the same age in terms of production and release. I don't know, guys. And if you guys have a hard time with me being objective, no, I'm not negative. Do know that I am not negative. But I will stand up for good art and good writing. And at the expense, at the risk of someone like George Lucas being forgotten 50, 60, 70, 80 down, years down the road. Oh, yeah. I'm going to bring that up. I'm going to bring that up. The whole Filoni verse is not the way. It should have been mentor Padawan. Not usurper. <laughs> no, I, I won't abide by that. And, and, and I will defend my thoughts on that. Because no artist, no artist, especially someone who brought us Star Wars to begin with, no artist should ever be replaced. Oh, I got a lot to go. Man. And I, I might have to use the restroom, guys. Goodness, I have. <sighs> we got a lot of chat here. Um, maybe I should put up some music or something and, and use the bathroom. Do you guys? <laughs> um, let me find the. Okay, we'll start with Evie with this question. Actually, maybe maybe I'll have a, a, a sound engraver tag, but uh, Evie says, I also think of original characters designs where the artist in question thinks a bunch of things that look cool and stylish on a person and put them all on a character, making them look too cluttered. Oh, that's a good point. Actually, let's, uh, let's stop on that note. I'm gonna be right back. And yeah, I'll be right, right back. All right, so I'm back. Cool. Yeah, that's a good point, Evie. That's a really good point. Owen Lister says, in Western animation, people seem to overindulge in more simplified style in art because it's easier to animate. But it's also made a good tone of animators lazy because of it. Yeah. And I, and I would say that the same is true for if you have really powerful technology and you take all these shortcuts. And, and not think about what it's doing to the aesthetics of the game or the show. Yeah, that's a good point, Owen. Daniel Craig says, the wind chime is best used in a fashion like one of my favorite producers, Nick Warren, uh, how he uses sounds. Lots of different one-offs for two or three notes and then never heard again. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a really good effect. 
Professor Geek says, where do you draw the line between remaining true to your genre and style and overindulging? Uh, that, that's a good point because you do want to be known for your style or your signature. I would say, I guess what how you could start is, is know if it's too much for you. So for me, even if I like an instrument, even if I like an electronic instrument, I can't hear that instrument more than one to two, two tracks in an eight track album. Because maybe I might work with similar harmony or maybe I will work with a similar bass line or percussion section. So I have to have a little bit of variance involved. I'm not against repetition and I'm not against patterns, but I think you want to create more anticipation. And, and if, if the person is expecting you to do a certain thing over and over again, I think, I think it can get a little dull. Some people like that. Some listeners of, you know, music, they like to listen to music that, that they expect and all of that. That's fine. Um, I guess it depends on the function. It depends on your audience. It de depends on your own creative process and it depends on the function. So in terms of remaining true to your genre and style, I guess I can only speak for, for music right now, but m my style is, is experimental, which gives me the ability. It, it gives me that allowance to uh, work with a lot of different tones and a lot of different soundscapes and textures and um, ambient tones and harmony and all of that. I don't have, I don't think I'll struggle with overindulgence in that way. I think it's easier to see with something like visual art. So maybe you're drawn to a kind of style or color palette, or you you like sinuous shapes to hard edged shapes with with ang angles and lines. What I would say, I guess the tip I would say is try to make every piece of art unique to its own as as a standalone and of course you'll see patterns or you'll you, you, you will hear patterns in music that that is the same from previous tracks or previous albums or whatnot but i would say try to make every single project inside a bigger project or every single big project unique to its own H have it stand out as as its own thing in the best possible way All music needs at least eight minutes. I don't know. I I do like brevity. Uh, I I like uh, I, I like things in three minutes or less. Um, I, I would say four minutes, maybe not fewer. Definitely, I, I would say not fewer than three. But that's that's just me with my kind of style. Uh, I do like longer tracks. I I do. I like to be able to be in a track for like 17 or 18 minutes if the music is engaging. I've listened to very long tracks that <laughs> where the music goes nowhere. And that is, that's actually probably an example of overindulgence. I, 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 I listened to this, this man, I think he follows me on Twitter. So I decided to check out his band camp and uh, like out of all his, 14 albums or whatever it was. I maybe liked one track. The tones were really beautiful, but it tended to be a little bit too, too much. And it was 11 minutes and 50 seconds. And I was like, okay, where's this going? I, I need, I need to get to some other point as beautiful as this is. I have to get to some other point. Big Al Percent says, is a radio station playing TLC's Waterfall twice an hour over indulgence? I heard that song too much when it was popular. That's a really good point. I'm not sure about this particular example, but 
that is the problem of radio. And I bet Fan Man and Aged Boomer would be really good to talk about uh, this with because I, I, I do not like, I do not care for songs, you know, Billboard number one songs or songs off the charts that are played again and again, even if it's well done. Even if it's well done, I, I wish radio stations would get more creative and understand that there is, there, there are really good songs out there, creative individuals that, that need a lift, that need a boost in their career. And even something that is very creative, even something that is well written and, and composed very well, musically speaking, if it's, if it's played more than once an hour, I think, I think it's too much. Because, you know, three to four minutes every 60 minutes, not including commercials, that is a lot of time. That is a lot of radio time. That's a lot of air time. I, uh, <sighs> TLC's Waterfall. I'm thinking of the song, don't go chasing waterfalls. Stick to the rivers and the lakes that you're used to. <laughs> Is that the song? I don't know that song that you, you're referring to. Um, I agree. This is to the professor, but um, I agree with Brian's. And I would say branch out. Don't stick with one thing too much or, or you, you will stagnate. You know, this is a this is kind of good with my writing because every character in, in, in my team of protagonists, I've got about eight characters eight main characters in, in this team. And it, it's a it's a massive space opera. It's probably gonna be four lengthy books. So I think eight is a good number for, for characters. Uh, not every character will have as much screen time, so to speak, as, as the next character. But when they do have th their perspective, you know, in, in front of you, when you are in their perspective, there, the, the narration, the prose is different. So my main character, who's a woman, her prose is going to be different. Her line of thinking is going to sound different from uh, her love interest, for instance. You know, it, it'd be the same. Actually, it is the same with Timothy Zahn, you know, where, where we're in Han Solo's perspective and then we're in Leia's perspective. I would say Zahn kind of got a little bit lazy with characters sounding the same. I think Luke Skywalker and his perspective definitely did sound different from Han. Lando and Han, yeah, they're buddies, so I could see why their their perspective would be the same. They, they've got the same rogue experience, you know, the smuggler's experience. Leia had her own unique perspective, Maybe it's her relationship with Han that makes her sound sometimes like Han. So I guess it does depend on the relationship. But that's a good example for you writers out there who are trying to, you know, do kind of a team up or like a, a, a cast of characters, you know, an ensemble of characters. If 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 you're if you're writing their thinking, you know, in the form of prose, not not dialogue, but prose, they will have to sound different. They will have to uh sound different from one another if if you're using third person uh third person omniscient is that is that what that is oh it is that song <laughs> that's funny <laughs> that's great so do 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 I'm going to kind of scroll down the chat, guys, unless you tag me. I'm going to offer the counter to offer the counter to not using the same instrument. Play to your strengths. Uh, oh, the counter. You're offering me the counter to not using the same in instrument. Play to your strengths. I think so. I mean, this guy, um, what's his name? His name, I think it's a him. I actually, I don't even know. I don't even know where he is, actually. Or she. She could be a she. I don't know. Uh, but the artist's name is Dense, so I just I just wrote that in. He's he or she or it, one of my favorite uh, 
recent favorite electronic music producer. I every time I see an album or a track release, I check it out because I I enjoy it. Well, this this person, this artist, whoever they are, they have a very specific instrument. It's got um. He he has he has a couple. I think he's he's a he. I, if, if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, dense. If you're watching, I'd be I'd be thrilled if you're watching. But uh, uh, there, there's one where it's got kind of like a clear sounding electric reverberant trumpet, which is very attractive, and then kind of a a, a keyboard instrument that's that almost sounds like a harp, but instead instead of like an attack with like a like a an envelope like this, you know like that it's um it's got like a little bit of a resonance so it's like a sharp attack but it's like a, a little bit of a resonance it, it's got a very unique sound to it. it it's a warm round sound but it's also salient it's 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 very uh it, it, it's got a little bit of kick to it as well and i love those instruments this this artist use um that that, that this artist uses but the the, the thing I would say, I'm not complaining about his music. It's it's well written music. It's well composed and it's very well produced. But I'm expecting. I'm always expecting this instrument, and it's not that I'm against this instrument used all the time. But I wonder. Well, if if that instrument is so attractive, I'm sure this person could produce a lot more as far as you know producing many attractive instruments. And that's that's what that's what I would say. So this this example of overindulgence might not be the best one. It, it really does. It does depend on the artist. Back to the drawing board says, I think one limitation on art is rendering. In inking, especially too many artists get caught up in the tiny details that often wind up making things feel cluttered rather than realistic. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's important to know. And you guys probably have an eye for that visual detail. I, I have more of the aural detail. Um, but yeah, you guys definitely probably have that eye. Owen Lister says, my overindulgence is that I always wanted to make my own expanded universe, but I realized recently I just need to focus on one story in its own world and characters. Well, yeah, and, and that, that raises a good point. As far as expanded universe, it usually just starts with one, or it usually starts with one story. So I think that the expanded universe, you know, give yourself the time and patience and uh, and totally accept, if, if it's okay with you, Owen, totally accept that this could be a lifetime of work. This could be a lifelong work of yours. So maybe it will be an expanded universe in, in time. But don't, I wouldn't start with an expanded universe. Um, I'll, I'll use my example for uh, these 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 worlds like I'm, I'm coming up with these names uh, of these these plains and these deserts and these mountains and and these planets and these cities and stuff like that. And they're beautiful names. I'm, I'm being very careful about my names. It's like Tolkien. He's, he was very careful about making names sound right and sound beautiful. Well, th the problem with the this this idea is that well, it's not it's not problems. Actually, it's, it's actually a good thing. I'm coming up with all these city names and these 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 the the names of these oceans and these mountains and stuff like that, but actually the world in in, in the these worlds these cities and stuff that these names that are mentioned they, they involve worlds that are really not a part of my plot except for a very little bit. They're not they don't take place. Uh, the story doesn't take place as far as plot and character developments in these worlds. And I'm just thinking of and dreaming of all these names and I'm thinking, you know, these these planets that I'm having names for, they're going to have their own stories. So maybe I will have a, a, an expanded universe on some level with, with my stories, but not now. Not now. I have to focus on the actual space opera itself. So I, I would say a universe, an expanded universe is going to be I think will come into play for you, Owen. Um, but that kind of thing, you know, the the that kind of work could be decades long. It could be decades long. Uh, 
That is right, Melissa. Uh, music is an art form. Jedi Master Cetopia says, limitations are crucial in order to get the theme of your work across to others means communicating with them on a shared level and then leading them into new and different directions. Yeah. You can be pretty creative when you set limits on yourself. You know, set limits on yourself and, and find what you can do with those limits. You'll, you'll, you'll find some amazing things. But, but, but sound engraver, that character's my baby. Well, not to insult anyone, but uh, <laughs> like someone who's really obsessed with their character. Now I'm, I'm obsessed with my stories and characters, but they, they have their place and they have their story and then they have their closure. Someone who's obsessed with a character and, and insists that their character are involved in everything what does that sound like to you? It sounds like a soccer mom. I have to have my child in this play. I have to have my child in this basketball team, on this basketball team. I have to have my child taking three music, you know, you know, music lessons for three musical instruments. They have to have an art class. They have to have a cooking class. I mean, now speaking from a, as from a music teacher's perspective, please get your child focused on one thing. With Ahsoka Tano, please get her involved with one main story separate to the Jedi Order. One story. One. She's having all the bad guys. I'm sorry. That Sorry. I just totally, I just totally clipped the, the audio. Are you guys okay? <sighs> oh, that's going to sound brutal. What Minute mark. One, one hour, 31 minutes and 35 seconds. I just totally, ugh. But no, she has all the bad guys, guys. That's not any character's role. But that that sounds like a soccer mom. No, 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 no disrespect to soccer moms out there. But it's like, it's like, I have to have a child in everything. It's like, well, do you want them to be good at one thing or mediocre at best in everything? <sighs> I'm sorry for shouting at you guys. I hope I hope that didn't sound rough. Back to the drawing board says, it can be hard to tell when the artist isn't overindulging. I'm gonna read that again. It can be hard to tell when the artist is overindulging and when other factors are dragging these things out. I'm thinking of studios demanding more movies in a franchise, for example. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. Uh, I'm trying to think of examples for, for franchises. Maybe you guys, I mean, we, we kind of talk about it, but I think uh, Fan Man and the Professor really talk about it with DC. N not that there's, you know, according to the Professor, there's really no saving the, the company now. Uh, it has to be something else. Uh, something new has to kind of emerge from this, uh, the, the, the stuff, what's going on with that company and, 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 you know, companies like Warner Brothers. And that is one good example of overindulgence in the DC world is the use of Batman. Um, he's, he's used everywhere and everything. And, you know, of course, Superman has been pushed aside, but it's not to mention all these other characters in that world that haven't been given the limelight. So, yeah, that's a really good po point as well. Yeah, actually, Melissa sums it all right up. Too much of a good thing can be bad if you overindulge. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you can actually eat too much healthy food if you eat too much food. You know, you can actually eat too much of things that actually are nutritious for you. It, it, it's the same way. And, and I don't know quite why people are... Oh, it was back to the drawing board. I don't know why people are 
um, insistent upon seeing things. It's like, it, it speaks of our culture. I'll get back to back to the drawing board, but it, it speaks of our culture when we have to see what we love everywhere. No, no, everything in moderation, everything in moderation. That's right. So it was back to the drawing board. That was that was you and I was reviewing. I was reviewing Common America too. Yeah, and you you mentioned that, and I, I'm glad you picked that up because I don't really know much about the visual in terms of comics, but you you did pick up that really good point where, uh, and I think I, I think I was right in remembering what you said that that the protagonist's face and hair kind of looked like the villain's face and hair, depending on like the, the there were dark there were there were dark images of the villain, so it was kind of hard to see, but. It, it was obscured, but still kind of looked like the protagonist. So, yeah. Oh, good. You guys are talking to each other. I had heard about that back to the drawing board. I think it was uh, David Stewart who, who brought that up where the author of Death Note got roped into continuing the series after the point he wanted it to end. That's bad. I don't, if I had a series or a, yeah, a series of stories that have a definitive end and people say, no, no, we want more. I, I would really have to put my foot down. Like, no, there's no more you, you ought to do with these characters. If you want to expand on the, in, you know, on in the world they live in, fine. But have new characters in that same world, maybe a different timeline, or maybe a different part of the history, the chronology of, of that world. But when when a character has a finish, it's good. It's good. That everyone has a finish. Everyone has closure inside their lives, and then ultimately their life. There's an there's an end to everything. And, and I just, I've said it before in my stream, I think people have a very, uh, they, they have, gr they're, they're very uncomfortable. They have great discomfort with, with the idea of something coming to an end. But things, things have to have an end. Well, 10 says most are existing characters, but they are getting updates due to me writing their placements in the story. Yeah, good. Yeah, I I can see that. I can see that happening. Ugh. Looks like you guys are talking. Shot down in flames. Welcome. Overindulgence shows a lack of creativity, especially when you referenced it to Ahsoka. If she becomes the focus of the Star Wars universe, there are lots of other characters in that galaxy. Well, not only that, every character has their own story. So if you want to talk about realism, you know how, how people in Hollywood are so harping on us like we have to make this as realistic as possible well you know what you're certainly not doing that with ahsoka in a real life scenario people branch out and they go off and do their own thing so maybe she does have a really compelling arc if if you if you've seen my video you i actually got when i when i was thinking about it, i was really excited about this idea of her saying yes to darth maul and them teaming up and her trying to find ways to prevent maul from seeking vengeance on Obi-Wan while maintaining the light side of the force, while preventing his chaos and destruction, while working with him to defeating Darth Sidious. Now, ultimately, I don't think Maul or Ahsoka, even as a team, could defeat Emperor Palpatine. That's that's just me. I, I, I guess I could be wrong, depending. Um, but no, no, that was Anakin's role. That was Anakin's purpose to defeating uh, Palpatine once and for all. But the idea, the motive behind it is really cool. That would have been a great team up. She would she would understand the dark side and the ways of the dark side while trying to maintain the integrity of the light side and understand to defeat, you know, understand the dark side to defeat the dark side. That that's what the Jedi were was lacking anyway. The Jedi were lacking understanding the dark side. That that was definitely the case in um, episode two, Attack of the Clones. 
and and episode three, Revenge of the Sith, where where the Jedi had had become blind to to the a powerful, the most powerful dark side force user sitting in front of them, and they did not see. How cool would an arc like that with Ahsoka have been, where she actually it, it's staying true to her character. She did leave the Jedi Order, and then she would work with a dark force user. I think that would have been a great thing for Ahsoka or, or for something like that for Ahsoka. It's not that uh, one of the criticisms or a couple times people criticized me for thinking, oh, she wasn't supposed to have closure with her arc, that her, her arc was not supposed to close. I never said that in my video, by the way. The closure I'm talking about with Ahsoka should have been with Anakin Skywalker and the Jedi. She could have had her own story. And in fact, I think she did. She didn't she have a novel or something like that? She could have had her own story completely away from the Jedi. And I would have been fine with that. In fact, I would have I would have wanted to see something like that. I would have wanted to see something compelling like that. But no, they they really had to have her with Anakin and with the Jedi and now with Luke Skywalker, apparently. And um it, it, it's it's sad. And uh, guys, I'm not saying this because of Ahsoka Tana only. I'm saying this for the love of all good writing and characters. For any character. for any, Let this apply to any character you love or you're producing as a writer. The, the problem with oversaturating your characters in, into different stories is you might be missing a more powerful, more compelling arc for that character. Something more meaningful. The most meaningful I can get with Ahsoka Tana right now with the, the way the writing is going is that they're they're supplanting Luke Skywalker. I, I know that sounds harsh. And you know what? If I'm wrong, I will have a party hat. I will even have like a an IPA. I'll have like one of those, you know, I'm ready. I'd, I'd be partying. There'd be confetti. There'd be confetti all around my room. We'd play some music. We'd stream, we'd have a party stream. And I'd say, I was wrong. I, I want to be wrong about this, guys. But I, I just don't know. Back to the drawing board says, no, we cannot culturally appropriate the names. What if cultures start mixing and joining each other? That would be terrible. Are you talking about like when, when American readers can't pronounce a Japanese name or, or a Korean name? Yeah. Um, yeah, if someone pronounces a name in their head incorrectly from what the author intended, so what? So what? Uh, Brian, I would suggest this. You, you should only put that name, uh, uh, put name pronunciations in the story if the name is very hard to pronounce. I would say this. No, rather than that, just, just put a glossary. Uh, C.S. Lewis did that. Tolkien did that with the Cimmerillion. I remember having a collection of the Chronicles of Narnia where they had every name. Actually, now that I think about it, C.S. Lewis, they had the name and who the person was, but I don't think they had the pronunciation. I can't remember. But Tolkien did. Uh, just a list of all these names of all these places and all these people and, and, and how to pronounce. I can't remember if it was in the Cimmerillion or another anthology book, but it was helpful. It definitely was helpful, but not in the text, not in the prose. I, I would, you know, unless it's dialogue, it, unless unless you have a character reading a person's name from a piece of paper or from a tablet and say, oh, how would you pronounce this? And then the person actually enunciates it through dialogue. That's fine. But in the actual prose, no. Because what, what does that do? That actually pulls the reader out of that world because the person with the name that's hard to pronounce isn't thinking about how to pronounce that name or maybe people associated with them they're not thinking about how that name is pronounced so anyway yes jedi master zetopia is correct if you are not getting your point across it is never the reader's fault it is your responsibility to make your point clear yeah make your point clear without spoon feeding i, th I think Wherever that line is, wherever you draw that in the sand, just, just make that clear. Wolf 10 says, 
Uh, my annoyance with the Soka was surface level. New outfit, new lightsaber style, double sabers. Sure, it was a progression of time, but she still was a Padawan and not a knight, at least. Yeah, I mean, I like her design. I liked her design much better when um, she went from the kind of the shirt with the midriff to uh, that 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 red with the with the sleeves with the cutout cutout sleeves. I thought that was I thought that was fine for her age. That that was a I thought that was a really good outfit that that was um, effective for her fighting style and all of that. I, I didn't mind her her appearance and her change. Um, I do remember the professor saying that there was no actual character growth with the change of outfit. And I guess she's taller. I think she's much taller in season three or season four. I can't remember what season that where they changed the outfit. And that I can understand where people would have a problem. Sound of Graver, all the above professional. Well, thank you, and you the same. Uh, well, Ted says, I had to ask because I know my defining flaw is that I can become emotional and impulsive, which fuels my aggression. And my rigid thinking and sternness and often uh, intimidates people. Yeah, the, well, here, here's what you have to do um, with that. You have to be stern in your position but you can still be respectable and you could still be uh, seen as someone who can be approached and someone who could be, you know, reasoned with, of course, and, and someone who could just be spoken to and, and, and have like a cup of coffee or something like that. Uh, so while I remain very strong, very adamant on my stance of being objective when it comes to art, first of all, I mean, you guys see me, I don't, I don't look too intimidating. Right. Um, and I, and I still welcome disagreement and I still welcome opinions. Um, and, and if people, you know, misconstrue my words, yes, I will bring that about. And I won't, I won't attack anyone at all. You know, it's not, it's not my place or my position. It's not my position or place to uh, attack anyone. Um, I just want to defend what I've said. I, I want to defend how clear I'm saying it. Cause I, I actually have been in my own chat, not, not none of you guys, but, um, and actually not no one in the professor community, but I have, I, someone has, uh, they've, they've taken my words out of context and they would, they would insert words that I was such way. And I would, I would doubt myself. And then I would go back to the stream. And I'm like, I did not do it that way. And, 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 and I realize I have to be very confident in, in being very clear what, what I mean, how I mean it, how I say it, because people, I don't think people, you know, most people don't, well, I'm giving people the benefit of the doubt. I would like to say most people don't mean to misconstrue a person's words. Though, I don't know. I think people <laughs> can have that malicious intent as well. Um, but be very stern with what you believe is is true, what you believe is is important, but also be professional and respectful, but also more importantly, uh, do it in love. And I would say, and I would say this, and, and I, this might be controversial. I don't think it's um, good to be too emotional about things. And I would say it's, that's more important for men than it is for women. Um, women have a, an emotional intelligence that is different and we might respond to things a little bit more differently. And I try to do everything with utmost composure as I can, even if, even when I get upset, even when I get angry. Um, but I think with men in particular, it's very, very important not to be emotional if you can help it, because uh, there's something about when a man is collected and he is calm and he still presents himself with nobility and grace and, and composure that there, there is just something when, when men do that, that just raises the bar and makes us want to resonate with you even more and also accept what you say, even if we disagree with it and, and also wish you the best. I, I have utmost respect for people, especially men who can, can hold their composure. And it's not to say you can't be emotional about something, but don't, don't, 
don't don't get out of hand. You know, don't don't get too don't get too much because I, I I've had the propensity of being angry. And then if, if I'm angry, all my logic is gone and all my sound reasoning is gone. Like it, it just, whoop, just leaves my brain. And I, especially something public, like a stream, I feel like I will say something out of line and I will regret it. And I, and then I will have to apologize when I have the propensity of that kind of anger or frustration, yes, I can get, I, I can lose reason and logic very quickly. So I think it's important part of professional uh, being professional is to, to, to n not have anger control you and your speech. It says, and I can't believe I don't know the verse right now. I'm sure the prof knows the verse. Be angry and do not sin. What does that mean? It means take to heart serious matters and have concern for those serious matters, but don't act or speak out of love or away from love. Speak with love. Speak with love. Do things out of love. And I think that will help. I think that actually will maintain your professionalism. Man, I am so far behind chat, guys. We're almost at the two hour mark. Oh. Professor Geek says, as Stephen King says, kill your darlings, even when it breaks your egocentric little scribbler's heart. Kill your darlings. That includes piety sentences as well as overused characters. Yeah. Yeah, because what what is it what is it doing ultimately to you as an artist when you overindulge? It means you're serving yourself. You're not serving the art. You're not serving the art and the role of what art should do to society and, and how to how to better better society, um, better culture, and and better you know our civilization. And when we overindulge, well, what, what is that? That overindulgence is a vice. Gluttony is a vice. You can't practice vice when it comes to art and have it be good in the end because vice ultimately brings down that end. It brings brings down uh, it brings down upon you your destruction, so to speak. Even if it's an artistic destruction, or even if it's a, a a project, you know, the kind of the undoing of a project over time, it's it's not immediate. But you, you got to approach your art very responsibly. Like that. Um, yeah, I, I guess I use the word cheesy just as a as a random thing that came out of my mind. Uh, I never agreed with uh, when someone says it's bad because it's cheesy, though. That's just me. No, no, no. Actually, cheesy cheesiness can be good too. Um, that that was just kind of a. a off the cuff descriptor I, I came up with. Professor Geek says, so you don't think it's important for Ahsoka to be integral to every important event in the Star Wars saga? Well, I know, Prof, I don't. <laughs> um, she she deserved better. That's that that's what I say. She deserved better. Schooner Tuna says, the reason why Star Wars quality has gone down is because it ceased being a single vision and has, uh, has become multiple visions with a lot of different ideas on what series should be transformed into. That's not, that's not a bad thing that you have those options with Star Wars. Not a bad thing at all. When you have that expanded universe, when you want to expand on that universe, that's great. That's great. But even with an expanded universe, you cannot have multiple visions. You have to have a singular vision. You've got to, you've got to treat this IP like a mission statement. Because that's what it is right now. You know, the Lucasfilm and, and Disney, they're companies. You have to have a singular vision. And this is not being myopic. This is not being narrow-minded. You have to have a very core, singular 
vision, as your core, as your impetus, then you proceed with all the other stories and all the other characters. But notice how everything has been haphazard. Notice how things haven't been completed. Notice how things have been branched off from the original idea. You know, it, that, that's the problem. If, or, or people just do not have a single vision. And, and yes, and I mean a singular vision, single vision for a multiple, uh, a, 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 a huge expanded universe with multiple storylines and, and all of that. <laughs> no, I think, I don't, I, I think the thumbs down came from, uh, no one likes chocolate. <laughs> that person didn't like chocolate. They were offended by the, 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 the specialty cupcake on my thumbnail. But Dave Filoni, if you're watching, uh, hello. <clears throat> Owen Lister says, I always thought Ahsoka was all right in Clone Wars, but my favorite character of that show uh, were the clone troopers, spe especially Rex. I love, and I also love Cad Bane. Who doesn't like Cad Bane? Cad Bane is amazing. Okay. <laughs> What a waste. Every time I think of Cad Bane in Clone Wars, I'm like, man, that could have been four episodes of season seven. You know, in terms of quality of story, okay, so there are three arcs, four episodes per arc. So that's 12, of course. And so you've got the Bad Batch, which I think was really good. So like one third of all of it was well, well well written. Actually, okay, to be to be perfectly fair, I didn't see the Trace and Rafa arc. I don't but I, I heard complaints like from, from most people. They they didn't care about that arc at all. Um but in any case, uh yeah, that's that's 33%. That's an F. Season seven gets an F in my book. Yeah, dude. Thank you. Tell your sister. You are right. I won't leave you. Father. It's good stuff. Well. I was, I was thinking of, of posting a, a Schooner Tuna's um, post. Now this, I, I might be a little far-fetched. This is just theory, just a theory. They've been trying to erase legacies for a while now with disastrous results. Get woke, go broke is more than just a saying. Well, here's the thing. People are, I, I, I could see where people are really nervous. I, I could see where like stockholders and, and people in the business and the producers are really nervous about messing things up now, especially, especially when they have to be so tight where they're probably under the water uh, because of, of this year and what this year has brought on all of us. But I will say this, um, Ideology runs deeper than business. Ideology runs deeper than money. Which means, I think they will continue the ideology until the business is run into the ground. And I have a theory. This is totally a wild card. I'm throwing it out, I'm throwing it out there. But it's for people to just kind of think about. If the ideology doesn't stop and the business is run into the ground, what's going to happen? In in short, Disney, the company Disney, could be the next PBS. Why? Why? I mean, why not? Government sponsored family shows. Disney is all about family. It's all about family entertainment. And if that business runs into the ground, someone's going to have to salvage a lot of stuff, and I think it's going to be the government. That might not be for another 20, 30 years if it even happens. But I really do think it ideology is doesn't pay any mind to business, guys. I have seen the dangerous ideology in the academics. I did not know. This is this is why I love this community, and this is why I've just loved following the Professor Geek channel and ultimately dating Professor Geek himself. <laughs> um, because his experience is very close to mine. And that is the ideology we saw in the academics, it is running rampant and it is deeply embedded, it's 
terrible philosophy of, of uh, this very um, uh, disdain for heroism, the disdain for the classics, the disdain for Judeo-Christian values. This is deeply cemented in companies like Disney now, Silicon Valley, all those people. Well, if their business is running to the ground, there's going to be an emergency reaction. And that is, we got to sponsor this. We got to spot, we, we uh, get, get the government, get, get, okay, start with California. Probably not. <laughs> Let, let's get this um, federal and let's, uh, let, let's do it the PBS way where, where the support comes from viewers like you. I, I really think that that's what ha would happen if, if Disney actually went down. It, 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 I think it's going to go down, but I think it's going to survive in, a, in the most insidious way. I, I know that sounds cynical, but I'm, I'm just, I'm still happy. I'm, I'm making my own stories. I'm cool. And sorry that that sounds like really, really dark stuff, but I wouldn't put it past him. I wouldn't put it past the government to sponsor Disney. Paid for in part or in full by taxpayers like you. They would have to because Disney is such a family entertainment. So anyway, that's just, that's just my, it's a theory, guys. It's a theory. I'm not saying it's going to be true. Oh, yeah, good point. Daniel Craig says, if anything can be replaced at any time, then we are in the forever now or well talked about. Yeah. Daniel Craig also says, I was going to say, I feel much worse for Finn. Yeah, Finn was mistreated. He, he was he was not treated well as a character. He was the punching bag. It was, you know, I mean, I, I don't care for the sequel tragedy at all. Uh, but one thing I, I, I mentioned before with, with uh, The Rise of Skywalker, they had great chemistry. Those three, those three actors had great chemistry on screen. They should have went with that, man. They should have went with that with the original characters. And I think Finn would have been a much character for it. That 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 side quest with Last Jedi. What were they thinking? What were they thinking? Owen Lister says, I wanted Finn to be the hero. But yeah, I mean, like the ad, the poster for Force Awakens, he had the blue lightsaber. Yeah. People just don't think things through. Come on, like if you saw if you saw Finn with a blue, blue lightsaber on the poster, he, he, that think tank in Disney, whatever think tank they have, they would think, okay, how are what are people's expectations when they see this actor with a blue lightsaber? And then it's the scene we got where he gets sliced in half or whatever. It's... Yeah, it's a little short-sighted. Well, no, that's the point. Yeah, actually, back to the drawing board. And I was kind of thinking about adding that point on. I don't know how to tell you this, but a lot of movie makers of, of 100 years ago aren't well-remembered now. I think that's true. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, and we do have a short attention span in this generation and probably generations to come, unless something, unless there's a huge overhaul and people just stop doing social media and stuff. Um, but uh, it, it's not that artists forgotten is, is, is impossible. I think it is possible, but the practice of it, you know, the active practice of replacing things. See, I'm sure a number of people have played pieces from the Nutcracker and don't know who Tchaikovsky is as a composer. Most people do. And most people go to the Nutcracker knowing Peter Tchaikovsky wrote it. I don't know how to pronounce Peter in, in Russian. But a lot of people do jazz renditions or pop renditions of pieces in, of the Nutcracker and they don't know who the composer is. I, I understand that. But there still needs to be some longevity. Most people know it's Tchaikovsky who wrote the Nutcracker. Um, people, I think, will remember Spielberg. Sp Spielberg. 
Steven Spielberg. Um, people better for sure remember John Williams, you know, but George Lucas also has that scope. He has that magnitude. Um, now, Star Wars also may be forgotten over the next hundred years or 200 years. I hope not. I hope it lasts for lo lo as long as that or longer. But the idea of an artist being remembered for something they didn't start, that's, that's the moral quandary there. That, that's, that's what I take issue with. Yeah, we, we could give credit where credit is due and, and give Dave Filoni all the credit he needs and all the credit he deserves. But the idea of people kind of replacing George Lucas with Filoni, I'm not saying Lucas is better in terms of writing or the creative process. I'm not saying Dave Filoni is better than George Lucas, but the idea of the one artist starting and then another artist learning from him and expanding on what he has made, but then ultimately, whether he wills it or not, whether it's Dave Filoni's intention or not, supplanting his mentor over time in history, in art, in, in art history and popular culture history, that's, that's what I'm more concerned with. It's not the actual... I've, you know, it's not that like 200 years from now, we're still kind of thinking about Star Wars and like, oh, who wrote that? It's not that, it's just the act of supplantation. Supplantation, is that, is that a word? I'm gonna look it up, supplantation. Supplanter, supplant. No, I don't think uh, supplantation is supplanting. I don't know. Whoever supersedes, um, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Um, that that's where I would have the the hardest time with with accepting. Oh, my chat jumped again. I got it. I got it. It's almost midnight. We're we're above the two hour mark. I really do need to move along so I can write or read or or do something. Oh, I see Netter. Oh, I see Agent Boomer. Oh my goodness. I see so much chat. <laughs> All right. My goodness. I'm like an hour behind chat, guys. So we'll try to keep going. It's Agent Boomer. Howdy. Sorry I'm late, Netter. That's okay. That's 1045, so that was like almost an hour ago. I'm so far behind chat. I already see the view count going down. I think it's like, oh, we're done. <laughs> All right. All right, so much, so much. This is worth mentioning, though. I'm sorry to say the focus of Star Wars is no longer telling a good story. Disney wants money and doesn't care if it's good or not. Filoni's instructions are to make more content. He will not be. I don't, I, um, yeah, I, I'm starting to lose this idea that, that they're, they're out for the money. I, I really, I don't think so anymore. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Because the way they treated Mulan in that new film, yeah, that made a lot of money in reviews. I don't think that I don't think money is it anymore, guys. My goodness. Lots of chats. Okay, good, good. good. Brian Gilmartin says, I'd like to try experimenting with darker colors in my art at some point, especially if my characters are going to be fighting monsters in a nighttime setting. That's cool. Uh, one thing I like um, about the Ichabod story. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Ichabod Crane, um, where 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 the, the Headless Horseman was outlined in white. I, I love that idea. And actually, I think Alan Lee, the concept artist, the Tolkien card concept artist, I think he outlines everything in white. And it's got this really unusual look. It's really beautiful. Kind of otherworldly.
man, I am so far behind chat. <laughs> yep, waterfalls was the song you sang. So yeah, that was the one. We're just coursing through chat right now. Um, Oh, and Lister says, just got done with the Justice Jet. Sci-fi fantasy weapon charged by a magic gem that shoots a destructive beam. Is that, are you sure a destructive beam is justice? Gotta remember. Oh, good. Thank you for that quote. Restriction, restrictions breed creativity. Mark Rosewater. That's a nice last name. Yeah, yeah, I, I I hate the sound of a hot mic. Actually, I checked out a Geeks and Gamers video and I, I have not seen his video in months, but I remember um, watching a couple of his videos months back and his mic was always hot. Like he, he, shout, he shouts in the mic and it, it's not loud, but the clipping is very distorted. It's a very unpleasant sound. And so when I'm shouting, I, I heard that, it's, and that's ugh, I that's gonna it's gonna sound rough for people if they if they watch. <laughs> uh, I feel popular reviewers this Owen saying I feel popular reviewers and influencers online are one reason why there's so much overindulgence of a lot of things because of um, shills and fanatics. Yeah, I think. I mean, I don't, I don't use those terms, um, shill, for instance, but I think they're paid to do what they do. Well, of course they're paid to do what they do. So, you know, if, if they're fine, if they're comfortable with that job, I don't agree with what they do. But if they're comfortable with that, then that you kind of have to accept. It's kind of like um, it's like it's like the job of like a. Um, I do not agree with this job at all. Like I, I, I <laughs> but those scammers, like the you know, you know, people saying you know you're. Your, your car was repossessed and, and we're after you, you know, and stuff like that. Or we're going to be after your car. We're going to be after your credit cards and stuff like that. And I, um, I, I actually, so I, I don't like it when, when people bully through the, those things through the phone. I, I, I can't stand, I have no respect for those people. I, I had not, I wasn't in any financial trouble, but I did have a, um, a scammer caller. Was it me or was it a friend? Maybe it was a friend of mine who relayed this, but, um, I think it was him. He had a, a caller that was really starting to berate him and, and really put him down on, on these, um, these, whether it's financial issues or like a scam and stuff like that. And my friend's like, is your mom ashamed of you? She ought to be ashamed of you right now. Uh, I don't know where I was going with that. Um, so I don't care for people doing those jobs with a clear conscience. I start, I could not make a dime. I couldn't, I couldn't make, I couldn't make a million dollars doing a job like that, you know, harassing people and getting them worried and scared and fretful over bills or something like that. Um, and I think it, it, on the same lines, n maybe not completely, uh, that's my impression of, of what people refer to as uh, shills. You know, they just, they just do it for the money and they don't, they don't do it for preserving art or anything. How beautifully ironic. You, you, you raise a good point. A great art for Ahsoka, she needs to know the importance of letting go. That was Anakin's plight, really. That was that was Anakin. That's why she was written in the first place. So Anakin would learn or not learn how to let things go. But we couldn't let go of Ahsoka. So uh, <laughs> there you go. Oh, a squeak. Yeah, that's my chair. That, that's my chair. I don't have a new chair, but it's it's not squeaking now. It's being shy. But yeah, that, that's definitely, that is my chair. Yeah, um, I, I agree, Jedi Zootopia, where it's fine to have the Skywalker story over. Absolutely. Um, now, if you want to go a thousand years in the future, sure. 
that, that's fine. That's probably what they need to do. Um, the thing is, in, in story writing, there's a place for cushioning things. Like, I, I, I really do like the Clone Wars, how, how they um, really added a lot of girth to the events between Attack of the Clones and the Revenge of the Sith. I think that's great. I really had a absolute respect for Anakin in, in that show. Um, and, and I really like seeing him on screen and I like his romance with Padme and his, his kind of bickering and bantering, but also his this beautiful com um, camaraderie between him and Obi-Wan. I think it's great. It really is great. I love Obi-Wan and his treatment there too. You know, especially with the cube and Cad Bane and, and, and then um, Darth Maul with um, Obi-Wan fighting Savage Opress and Darth Maul. <sighs> One of the best fight scenes I've ever seen. Um, so yeah, it's done a lot of things, but the, the problem is now stories are being made or they're tied to every other story, whether they're tied to the Clone Wars or they're tied to the Rebels or they're tied to the original trilogy. They, I, I think they might be tying it to the sequel trilogy as well. I, I could be wrong though. Again, I could be wrong. Um, but I wouldn't put it past them. I certainly wouldn't be surprised if that happened. Um, so, yeah, I, I would think with, with such lore, go down 500 years or so. Really do something else. But people, I mean, it's just like with Disney and reboots, people are just so afraid of trying something new with new characters. No, I guess they're trying to do the same like with new characters of the High Republic, but how that doesn't that doesn't look interesting at all. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Ephesians 426. Thank you. I appreciate that. It is almost midnight. Oh my goodness. I've been up for too long. Okay. Okay, I think I'm almost cut off with chat. Jedi also says, uh, a singular version is what helps Marvel movies right now. There is no way Disney would have had the patience to tell a story over 23 movies if Kevin Feige hadn't taken control. I can't, yeah, that, I mean, the, the scope of what had happened with those Marvel movies is pretty spectacular. Uh, but yeah, no matter the worlds, no matter how many characters, you just gotta have a single vision for all of it and then expand from that. You gotta use it as an impetus. You gotta use it as a, as a core. If you don't have a core, if you don't have a mission statement, so to speak, you're going to be haphazard with your art and all that. Shut down in flame says, so true what you say about ideology. Yeah. It's out there. Oh, yeah. Actually, I, I usually say sequel tragedy. Uh, that That is my reference, too. It's kind of like Fan Man. He, he says Farce Awakens, uh, Lost Jedi. I don't know what he calls the uh, Rise of Skywalker. What does he call her as Skywalker? I thought he said something, um, but I can't remember. Adding on to the disdain in heroes, disdain of Judeo-Christian values, the academic world as also shows a disdain in being American. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, I skip down. All right, gotta go, Evie. Okay, bye. I'll see you. At, you know, things are winding down. Um, That might, I, I don't know if that's true, Melissa, on PBS, but who knows these days? Piotr, Piotr. The Russians say Piotr. 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 All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it is actually, it's kind of time for me to turn in as well. So I think I caught up with chat. This is a good time to end it. Um, so... Lot, lots going on. Let's let, let's plug a few things. Um, sound experimentation. I'm back in Super Collider this week trying to do some more things in Super Collider. So be on the lookout for some sound experimentation every Thursday. And of course, long, live commentary every Monday nights here at 9.30 p.m. Um, we've got uh, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We've got Catholic Bible Geek Book Study. The, the start of 
The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the second installment, the chronology, second part of the chronology of the, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, um, tomorrow, I believe, is it 9? Yeah, 9 p.m. Yeah, 9 p.m. Good. And um, that, that's going to be good. I'm actually almost done with the book. It's, it's a very, very fast read. Um, so that, that'll be fun. And then also uh, the Gospel of John, also 9 p.m. on Thursdays, correct? So if you want to insert that, that's great. Um, of course, we've got all our all our live streams. Um, Daniel Heron with soundtracks of Birdman and Age Boomer on Wednesday nights, and also Green Lion Girl with her game and streaming also Wednesday nights. And um, you know, uh, WCR with Wolf Ten Media and his talk, two uh, thirty Eastern time. Tuesdays and Thursdays. And of course, we've got our live rewatches. I actually, I got a rewatch coming up. I just realized on the 19th of December. Um, yes, also 9 p.m. on 9 p.m. Thursday. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of getting getting slow too. Um, rewatches, of course, uh, Saturday, uh, Saturdays. And I think it's Troy Pacelli doing 10 p.m. with Frosty and the Snowman, which I think would be fun. I think I saw that in my feed. So I think that's next. And of course, uh, the study hall with Aged Boomer and Trip Chili uh, every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time as well. Uh, we've got Fan Man, um, you know, kind of be on the lookout for what he does Fridays. Um, also, his second cup cafes Wednesday mornings will be, be great. And if anything, I, I may have missed, you know, we, we watches and all that stuff. Um, go ahead and, you know, turn to the Professor Geek Facebook group page. But until I see you next, if you have nothing more to say, I will say keep producing the art you love. Don't overindulge. And you guys have a blessed week. <laughs>